Alright, so we are going to explain this paper, General Adversarial Imitation Learning. Um, this paper has a fuck ton of math, which is like, I kind of appreciate what it is, but I don't really understand it that well. Like, but I understand it on a vague level. Uh, so we're just going to skip all of this. Uh, and, and to the algorithm, right? So this is what the whole paper kind of boils down to. This is a single algorithm. Um, so what the paper does, right, is... You shut up for a bit. Um, usually when you do reinforcement learning, it's useful to have a oracle or like an expert, right? So the expert would perform some kind of behavior and then what you do as a learner is you're just trying to copy it right so for my research i have um this pong game and i actually um developed a expert so this green guy is kind of the expert it never lose because it cheats by going to the future and predict where the ball will be and it can always return the ball, like it, it will never lose. So the goal is to figure out, you know, what are some, what are, what is a good scheme of replicating this behavior um, in such a way that it will behave like an extra, not just on this particular data set, but also in situation, like in new games of Pawn, right? Like this is a particular game of Pawn. If you just mimic the behavior, you know, exactly, it probably won't generalize. So what you want to do is you want a behavior that do as well as the expert on this particular data set, but also kind of generalize to new data sets and new games of Pong where, where it does just as well as, as the expert, right? Um, I mean, we can go into some part of the math. So um, essentially the way they compare their approach is against two different other approaches that, that they say they do better than those two, okay? So the first one is cloning, behavioral cloning. Essentially, um, the way you think of a, um, the, the, the teacher, the expert, has these traces, right? Basically, on this state, I do this. On this state, I do this. So what is a good way to imitate? You basically say, well, let's take all the state action pair from the traces of the expert, and we think of them as just a supervised data set, right? And then we just do supervised learning. We just say, on this set, on this state, um, what should the student do? Well, it should learn whatever the teacher does, right? So you make the student a neural network, and then you basically say for every um, action of, of the teacher, I'm just going to copy them, right? So this is supervised learning. So this will probably work well if every game every future game look like the game you already played and observed the teacher, right? You're just basically going to copy all, all the teacher's behavior. But what's going to happen when a game look a little bit different, then all of a sudden that's not in your supervised data set. So if your data set doesn't cover that well or the new situation is somewhat different, right? It's, it can fail, right? Because the student will be like, oh, I've never been trained with this input. I don't know what to do. And as soon as you make this one mistake, the behavior of the teacher is like a trajectory of, of, of action, right? It's not like a single action. So what will happen is as soon as a student diverge away from a trace or trajectory that the teacher is learned from, it's going to exponentially propagate. The error is going to get bigger and bigger, right? So for example, on, on this state, the teacher went left and the student accidentally went right. So the kind of state it will generate on subsequent action will look very, very different from the traces generated by the expert that you learned from, right? So as soon as you step off the intended trajectory, it will get worse and worse, and the student will probably go, um, you know, run off the bridge and, and kill itself, okay? So this is behavioral cloning is clearly bad or, or insufficient when your training data is small, okay? And the alternative approach is uh, inverse reinforcement learning. So what is inverse reinforcement learning is you see some behavior, and then you wonder, well, what is the underlying cost function that would lead to this behavior? And the right thing to do, and I think I, I never learned about inverse reinforcement learning before, but I think this is really clever, is, is something like this one, I think, is saying I'm going to choose 
a cost function over the environment such that the policy described by my expert is the best policy over all the possible policies. So one way to do it is we're going to uh, generate different world, right? Like it's, it's kind of like here is a expert player, he has certain behavior and you ask the question, well, in what kind of world is this behavior the most optimal one, right? So essentially the outer loop, you're generating different worlds. So the first world is like, oh, maybe this action good and this action is bad, or maybe these kind of behavior is good. So the outer loop, like this one here, generate all possible world and in within each world, you are doing a reinforcement learning in that world to see if you achieve the same result as your expert in that world. This is kind of like a crazy, crazy view, right? It's like if you see like you're some alien, you go to like a different earth, right? Like a parallel earth and you see people like eating bugs, like just eating flies, right? And then you're like, oh my God, I, I wonder why. So then you develop a world where eating fly give you a high reward and you're like, okay, this is how these people are interacting. They're acting like frogs because one way of explaining that is constructing a world where eating fly is good. So that's how inverse reinforcement learning work. It's like from the behavior, how do you come up with a world and a cost function scheme that, that explain these um, behaviors, okay? All right, great. And so essentially, once you have inverse reinforcement learning, you're saying, well, what are we doing with inverse reinforcement learning? Well, what we're doing is we, we have this policy and it's kind of over some finite number of uh, traces, right? It doesn't have, it doesn't, it doesn't generalize, right? It's like very finite. Like maybe you watch an expert play tennis, it's like only like two games or something, right? So what you do with uh, inverse reinforcement learning is from those two games, you construct a world with reward in such a way that these kind of behavior playing tennis is a high reward. And you have the world, and once you have the world, you can do reinforcement learning on top of that. And then you, all of a sudden, you get an agent that performs as well as the expert on this particular world. And you hope that the real world, whatever world it is that generated the tennis plane behavior is actually the same as the world you constructed by inverse reinforcement learning. So you can see this is a pretty complicated procedure, right? Because you need to build a world and to build a world, you, you basically have to enumerate over all the world and find one that actually, you know, this expert is the best one, right? So it's, it's kind of expensive. Um, but they did all this math. They, they basically said, you can kind of compress all of that logic. You can compress the logic in such a way that um, you don't need to construct the world. You just say, I, I want my agent to behave, like the end goal is to have my agent behave like the expert. So essentially the takeaway is you don't want to supervise just single state action pair of the expert, but you want to supervise learning on the whole trajectory of your agent. So basically, instead of doing supervised learning on, on each state action pair, you, you do supervised learning over trajectories. You say, here is a trace generated by my expert. All right, so for example, um, oh no, 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 not, not you, you, right? So for example, if, if I play pawn, right? You, you can see how this expert behavior, right? It's kind of stay in the middle, and then when the ball comes to it, it, it goes there and they touch it, right? So this is expert. So this is like some characteristic of the expert trace, right? And so let's stop that. And let's imagine we have a student, right? So, so let's see a, a behavior of the student trace, right? Um, so see, it, so first of all, it jitters and it doesn't touch the ball, right? So as a human, right, we can very fast, we can say, oh, this behavior, like over the entire trace, it doesn't act like the expert, right? Because the expert doesn't move a lot, the expert always touch a ball and so on and so forth. And so in a way, what this paper is saying is rather than doing supervised learning over state action pairs, you should do supervised learning 
over entire traces generated by the two policies. So the policy of the expert, you already have traces for, that's your, that's your training data. So, but what you should do with a student is you should take the student agent and you generate traces of that student. And the cost function should be minimizing the distance between those two traces, right? And how do you minimize the distance between those tr two traces? And uh, well, the best way to do it so far is you train a adversarial network. Yeah? Uh, what an adversarial network is, is saying, it's like, like a human, it's like us. Like we look at a trace from the expert and we look at the trace from the student. And we say, oh, these two are clearly different. And what you want to do is you want the student to come up with a trace that fools the judge, right? So you have a judge that can tell these two being different, like this is the expert, can, I know this is expert. And then you generate a trace from a, from a student and this is a student and the judge is like, oh, these are two different. And so if you want to have a good <coughs> um, agent that's a student, all you have to do is to attempt to fool the judge, right? So then you generate a trace that fools the judge, you're done. So that's essentially what it's doing. So in the first part, it says input, basically this is, you know, this is a trajectory sampled from the policy of the expert. So this is your training data. And then you iterate for a long time. And what you do, you sample a trace from the student. So you, you, you put your student, which is an agent, you put him in the environment, and he's going to act, right? It's a policy, it'll act, and you'll collect a trace from the student. And you use those traces to train the expert. And this is a cost function, basically says over the traces generated by the student, you want to classify that as zero. You want to give a, a, a score of zero to those things. And over all the traces generated by the expert, you want a score of one on those things. So basically your judge is this discriminator, which is a classifier who will say, um, if if I give a if I get a trace and it look like a student trace, I'm like this is garbage, and if I get a trace that looks like a teacher's trace, I'm gonna say this is brilliant. So essentially, this is how you train the discriminator. You train to to distinguish which one is the teacher and which one's the student. Okay, and once you train the discriminator, you could use it then to train the student's behavior and. Essentially, the student behavior it become very simple. It's basically over my trajectory, I I'm going to have a signal of saying how good am I doing on that trajectory, and more so, it's almost like on every single step, how good am I doing on that step, and essentially the test function, I mean the the, the optimization function is telling you you're doing better if the judge think you're an expert in that particular state. So this is how it works out. So you get one step supervision signal. This is like some regularization, so don't worry about it. Uh, so basically it says on, on every single step of your trace, you want to make the judge think you are the expert. And that's it really. So you go forever essentially this top one so basically the student will start to act more like the expert and the judge need to be smart just to tell them apart and once you do that the student will try again to fool the judge and they go back and forth back and forth and it will converge to something and this is a very very simple procedure to implement and to and to run and they the, i think the contribution of the paper is all this math and they prove that it's actually equivalent to inverse reinforcement learning, which is, which is amazing to me, I think. Those, those two processes are kind of like intuitively similar, but to show mathematically they are the same, right? So because look how easy uh, this is to implement. This is very easy to implement. All you need is some traces, you need a sampler, you need an environment that you can sample traces, and then you just train discriminator, and then you train you, you, you use your Q function, like, you, heck, you don't even need policy gradient, right? Like, this is like your reward signal Q, like it's right here, right? You don't even need to do reinforce, like, this is it, like one step Q function, like, this is really easy to run. And they show somehow this is almost equivalent to 
inverse reinforcement learning, which is really hard to run, right? Because if you think about inverse reinforcement learning, you are actually trying to construct a world with the cost function that best explain the expert. That's like so many inner loops of reinforcement learning being run, so super expensive. And somehow this simple procedure is somehow equivalent to it by some crazy math. So, so that's why this paper is good. It has, God knows, like 200 citations, so yeah. Okay.